So here comes an individual, if I may call it individual to present Guru Nanak, a child is born in that environment. He puts uh, that small city on the world map because of what? Because of what he brought, the revolutionary ideas he brought and the mandates he created while alive to change the realities, the, con the way he dialogued, the way he asked his question to his math teacher and his Sanskrit teacher and the Kazi of the town and the Brahman of the town. So in the Sikh world, I, my estimate is for almost 70 years, there was not much knowledge transfer. And I can give example of that. An average Gurdwara in a village, for example, Gurdwara, by the way, is not a worship center for Sikhs. It has become that now, even in Bombay. Right? It was a place of learning. It was a place of organizing. Like, this will shock you. A Gurdwara is used to organize political rallies also. 2023 is all about inter-religious studies on The Randi Show. We've done a ton of episodes about Hinduism and ancient Indian culture. This is a two-part special on Sikhi or Sikhism as most of the world knows. This was such an elaborate topic that we had to split it up into two episodes and that says a lot about our guest today, Harinder Singh. Personally, I feel there are very few people in the entire world who are capable of speaking about Sikhi as a subject in the same manner that Harinder Singh has. My only regret is that I couldn't do an episode with him in Hindi, but eventually we will. And the reason I say that is because you're not ready for the kind of information and passion that's packed into these two episodes. Episode one is much more focused on Guru Nanak Dev Ji, the history of Sikhism, the origins of it and the basic principles it's based on. As with most episodes of TRS, which are spiritual or historical, even this episode, highlights meditation as a human need. Dhyan, sadhana, these concepts have come up on this episode as well. Which is why before the episode begins, I'd like to direct you to Beer Biceps' own meditation app, Level Supermind. Make sure you download it from the links given down below. Make sure you follow TRS on Spotify. We're a Spotify exclusive. Every episode's available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. Lots of power-packed, historical, as well as spiritual content in this particular episode. Enjoy yourself. This is Harinder Singh on TRS. Harinder Singh, sir, welcome to the Ranveer Show. Nice to be here. Uh, I feel there's very few people who dedicate their entire life to one subject the way you have. I won't say it's one subject, it's one very wide subject. I'm hesitant to say the word Sikhism because you corrected me outside. Why should I not be using the word Sikhism? Well, it's fine. In the popular culture, that's what we say. But you know, our native terms are important. Otherwise, everything becomes Orientalist, right? And, this, and right now, there's so much deconstruction happening. So the term is Sikhi. You know, when people in India, South Asia talk about it, the original or the primary text talk about who Sikhs are, they call it Sikhi. Okay. Yeah. What does the word Sikhi mean? That's interesting. So, you know, there is a school of thought which says if you come from a Sanskrit angle, it means Shishya or disciple. And when you come from a Pali angle, it means the one who's already on the path. What is Pali? Pali is the first people's language of India. Okay. Uh, brought in from the Buddhist perspective. Okay. Uh, Sanskrit has always been the you know, language of the gods. So it was never the people's language. So I like to integrate things because uh, the gurus who came and the bhagats who came on the, who are contributors to Guru Granth Sahib, the actual source of truth of Sikhi, they actually use these words from people's perspective. Okay. So the, it's a learner who is on the path, not just experimenting, but pursuing a particular thing. Okay. So correct me if I'm wrong, sir, but uh, was Pali spoken across India or like in a majority of North India, I'm assuming? So that becomes a debatable thing, but Pali was the language of South Asia, we'll call it. Because okay. even India is a modern state. You know, mm -hmm. we get into this India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, it's South Asia, anything south of Khyber Pass, you know, every, the whole subcontinent as we call it today. Yeah, Pali was a state language. Pali was the people's language. Kind of like what Hindi and Urdu are to India and Pakistan. What Hindustani has been, which now has become Hindi and Urdu. Mm. Yes. Okay. Uh, so Pali preceded Hindustani. Absolutely. This is right. Ashoka period. And if you look at the earlier text, uh, and, and, and Sikh 
and the Indian thought is bringing those words, right? So when, you know, there are lots of words which we think are only coming from Sanskrit, many come from Pali. And as the words change, the meanings also change a bit, although the etymologies might be same. Okay. Uh, how do you begin teaching a very curious American about Sikhi? Especially <laughs> from a story perspective. I think uh, we have a lot of teenage listeners. And the reason this podcast has grown, especially in the history tangents, is yeah. because of stories. And I know it's something you don't truly wish to do. On the show, I'd also like to know why you don't want to get into the storytelling angle much. Well, I understand why stories are important. Look, I mean, if you want to change destiny of any nation, as they say, Goit has said that, you got to look at what people were the age of 25 were thinking. So if that's where you're going, more kudos to you, man, more power to you. Because that's what changes the realities and the next dreams are uh, created and they become realities then. So Sikh perspective is very clear on this. You know, the, the story of Sikhi begins with Guru Nanak. Here is 1469. It's a confrontation of what we now call Hinduism and Islam in Punjab. Those are the two dominant religions and confrontation in terms of ideas, in terms of even battles, in terms of ideologies and rulers. This is just the beginning of the Mughal dynasty in India, for example. You know, there's a lot of invasion that used to come from Middle East. And for example, at that time, Babur is coming. So that's the time in Punjab in a very, in fact, for your audience, if I say Guru Nanak put a very small village on the world map, that village now is called Nankana Sahib. It was called Rai Poidi Talwandi. In fact, I visited it several times. Where is it? It's a, the city is called Nankana Sahib. It is about uh, two hours from Lahore. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here comes an individual, if I may call it individual to present Guru Nanak. A child is born in that environment. And he puts uh, that small city on the world map because of what? Because of what he brought, the revolutionary ideas he brought, and the mandates he created while alive to change the realities, the, con the way he dialogued, the way he asked his question to his math teacher and his Sanskrit teacher and the Kazi of the town, and the Brahman of the town. It was not creating a ruckus. It was creating a dialogue because he's pursuing a particular love affair is what I call it. So one of the things I like, for example, is his conversation with his math and Sanskrit teacher. He's asking more why questions. Today in, in, in education, we call these imaginative questions, not trivial questions, which are more what questions. Like... Uh, for example, what if the moon disappears? What will happen to the earth? Is that a good example? That's a what if question, which is another thing. So uh, if I may give an example sure. of that. So he's, there's a ceremony. Let's talk about ceremonies because we all go through ceremonies, whether we like them or not, they're part of the culture. Sometimes they have religious fervors. So there's a ceremony in his house. And uh, it's an initiation ceremony, how you enter into adulthood, you know. There's a Hindu culture, so he's born in the Hindu particular caste. And that ceremony is going on. Instead of saying, I'm not going to go through it, he says, tell me why I should go through it. And why was this not available for my sister who is older than me? So that's what he's doing. He wants people to process. He's not rejecting. This is how most Sikhs presented. And he never said that. He writes about it himself. That's how I know. And when I read that, he's saying, Tell me what it will do to me. Why was this not availed to others? Why is exclusively just for me? Like the logic of things. That's what we call it, like a simple logic. Uh, today we may get into Descartian logics, but it's a higher logic. Sometimes it even transcends the mystic logics. Okay. Yes. So it's, it's essentially trying to carry people with it rather than saying rejections and disruptions. Okay. Before we move a little forward, one tangential question, sir. Sure. Does Sikhism have... Sorry. Does, no, you're fine. I understand. Does Sikhi have a mystical side to it? Absolutely. You know, everything is not logic and reason. It's a relationship. It's a love affair. How do you define the word mystical? I am very anti-definition because I think this is something in 20th century we have all become so used to because everything is about the law and the codes. And how can mystery be about the law and the code? Okay. How can the relationship... So mysticism is where you're experiencing something one experience is something which is not fully definable. Okay. It's an experience of, uh, in a human relationship, how can we analyze what happens between a lover and the beloved? Similarly, how can we analyze what happens between the human love and the divine love? Mm. 
it is to be experienced. The intimacy cannot be defined. Intimacy is experienced. Okay. I will let you continue the story, sir. <laughs> uh, but is, so, Sikhi has some mystical elements. Absolutely. And that's the, including in Guru Nanak's own, you know, so 1469 is when he's born. So that's the South Asia, what's happening at that time. You know, Mughal dynasty is about to get started. Babur has just attacked a town called Sadpur. I visited that. It's very interesting. And Guru Nanak protested against that. So that's the Guru Nanak you may not know. This is the historical Guru Nanak. He's protesting and the fight is between, they both have the same faith. They're both Muslims. But one is Pathan, the local ruler, the Lodi dynasty. And the one is uh, coming from Khorasan, uh, the area uh, sometimes between Iran and Afghanistan, that area we are coming from, right? And Guru Nanak witnesses the whole thing. And he questions it. And this is important just to put it in perspective. It's like a genocidal campaign going on. And mostly the victims are women. What we call today collateral damage. And he lists them. He says, I'm feeling the pain of Hindu women, Takrani women, the low caste women, and even the Muslim women who are reading the Qurans. Because that's who's getting killed and that's who's getting enslaved and violated, you know, the rapes included. And he, in fact, very powerfully writes, he says, I'm standing on the pile of dead bodies and I'm saying that this is the time to tell the truth, that this must stop. Nobody in South Asia, uh, no Sufi, no religious leader, even recorded a protest. He did, Guru Nanak did, and he was jailed for it. He spent time in jail. People didn't protest out of fear? Of course. Who's going to take on... Uh, what we now call the Mughals and the Pathans. Okay. Um, you know, when we speak about Mughal atrocities on the channel, often we're labeled as being right-wing <laughs> because we're targeting Mughals. But this is yeah. so important that the Mughals actually first targeted Muslim brethren. It, so it's, I think those labels create a problem. You know, like, like even the right-wing is a label. What we are saying is the religion is same where the fight is going on. Yeah. It's two men who in their power are violating everyone else. Yeah. Um, and Guru Nanak is protesting against, what are you doing to what we call rayyat or constituency today? Right? The people. You know, we're taught about Babur uh -huh. in our history textbooks as the first Mughal emperor. We're not taught all these things. That's right. Because this is the part which is, doesn't get recorded. So for, at the same time, just so we don't get caught up in anti babur thing, because this is not anti babur Babur comes to see Guru Nanak in jail. Because you see, one of the things in Islam we have to understand, Babur is not a regular guy. He is a scholar as well as a warrior. They are taught with the particular trainings. All the Mughals went through incredible trainings, actually. The Mughal emperors, I should say, Badshah Durte. So he comes to see Guru Nanak. And he sees that something ain't right here because in Islam, if you come across a spiritual individual, you're, not, you're supposed to eliminate all the wrong things you're doing to them. This is one of the trainings in Islam. And he sees there's something spiritual going on. He's organizing people and they had given him harsh punishment, which are peace, right? He was given time. That's the labor, right? You do in prison, you give labors. So he immediately releases him that they have imprisoned a wrong man. He's saying the right thing, but I don't like it. But he's saying the right things. But uh, how did he spot that uh, Guru Nanakji was? Well, you know, the, the traditions maintain and some secondary texts maintain that Babur came to see him and he heard about it the spear, you know, in the, in the vocabulary of Islam, that there's a peer who is saying this. This is not just another protester, as we would say today. Very stupid point I'm bringing forth. But I feel that because we live in the age of YouTube, <laughs> right. we take the why questions for granted now. I feel there are more answers to the whys now. You know, why is this thing being done? Why is this practice being done? Then there's some logic you can research and find out yourself. Yeah. At that time, it was a, no, no, you got to do what the elders have said. Not just, no, that's even today. Back then, they eliminated you. Mm. Oh, there is no questioning. Mm. I mean, we think dictatorship is big today. I mean, you see that in many forms globally. Earlier, there is no questioning. You're eliminated, you're killed. People were, because people didn't value human life. Mm. Sometimes we get desensitized in 2023 and we also don't do it right? by seeing certain images and the way we, the vocabularies we use, the violences we create, we are really desensitized. Earlier, the desensitization was incredibly high. The value, in fact, Guru Nanak, when he talked about that battle, which I referenced earlier, he uses this phrase. He says that jewel-like humans are being defiled by dog-like behavior. 
the value of human life is very, very important, regardless of what you believe in, where you are born, what your status is. We say that, but we actually don't value it. Okay. So, I still want to know a little bit about the 30 years that we were speaking about. Uh -huh. Meditation was a part of this? It always is. <laughs> but the word meditation, we should discuss a little bit. Okay. Um, so one day he joined uh, Muslims in his town to do namaz. He, he, he went to both places. He went to many places. He went to Jain places as well. Because he's a man of dialogue. He's a ma in fact, he himself has written, he, there's a question because he traveled a lot. And the question which we may ask, why did you travel? He writes the answer, Gurmukh Khojat Pahe Odasi. Odasis are his travels, his odysseys or his journeys. He says, I am a left home to meet uh, wisdom-oriented individuals. Now that's something, isn't it? So one time, he's actually in a local mosque and he joins them in prayer. And the Qazi, afterward he finished the prayer, says, I noticed you didn't join us fully today. He's like, because your mind wasn't there. Your mind was into what's going to happen with the animals he needed to sell somewhere. So meditation... When you invoke the word, what does meditation really mean? You tell Is me, it sir. the mindfulness as we like to talk about today, which, I mean, I used to work with uh, some areas of mind science foundations as well. So all these researches are continuing and the next, next evolution of this is unfolding in front of us. Um, so meditation is some sort of remembrance is how I like to present it today, as I understand from Indic traditions, because the word is dhyan. Mm. In Indian mythology and Indian philosophy, there are various schools of thoughts on dhyan. And most, almost all, today have come back to one of the major six schools of Hindu philosophies of Yoga Sutras, which really is about intense concentration. That's why Shiva is considered the ultimate yogi, because it is about concentration. But dhyan is not just about concentration. Dhyan is so you can develop a lifestyle of samadhi, which means you live in a particular lifestyle of continuous remembrance. Continuous meditation. As meditation. <laughs> and, and the reason I, I'm glad you did this because, you know, meditation in English is a Latin word with the French roots. It actually means pondering. Mm. Uh, one of my favorite uh, poets is Walt Whitman. You know, he wrote his book, Leaves of Grass, and he's a handwritten note, my meditation. Mm. And his meditation was... He says, I look up in the sky and I try to find the space where I'm standing today and my small place in this universe. So meditations is more like a reflections. God. In Indic tradition, meditations were really more about intense concentrations. Mm. Guru Nanak takes all this. He's very aware of these words. He uses these words and he says, for him, it becomes remembrance. Remembrance of the one who created me because I'm in separation from that one. And in that remembrance, I want to be with that one. It's very Rumanesque because Rumi has become popular these days. I'm recalling one of his um, uh, English translation oh. where he says, he says, you know, everyone's listening to Basuri read. And people love the sound of read, right? Depending on who's playing it. He says, she's really crying. She's really crying and she's saying, can you take me back to where I was carved out from? So Guru Nanak is in Simran. Simran is remembrance, literally. In the remembrance of the one who created me because I am you and I want to be with you in your presence all the time. So the quote-unquote dhyan or meditation in Guru Nanak's practice, in Sikh practice, becomes living in the remembrance of the one, not just concentrating. So concentration is a very mental thing. He's saying, oh, absolutely. Like I've gone through many techniques. I can get into that in my own journey of religions, including very Tibetan, serious, intense meditations, as we call them. Uh, but what Guru Nanak takes them is, how do you go from creating that intense meditation or concentration in the mind to intense remembrance in the heart? Has it been documented what kind of dhyan he was specifically doing or was it different types? He writes it himself. And this is the beauty where most Sikhs or non-Sikhs or audience who are trying to understand Guru Nanak or Sikhs may not know this. He extensively wrote about what he did. The difference is this, and the difference in terms of what we are used to today, he doesn't write it as a method. He writes it as a love affair. 
That's why I keep using that word. It is bhavna word, you know. It's preet, it's sneh, it's ishq, it's mohabbat. And which methodological people talk about this? Only mystical people talk about that. Is it like bhakti yoga? No, because that itself is a different school of thought. So he's very aware of it. He references it. He has conversations with those who did bhakti yoga. You, you'll have to give some context on what bhakti yoga is. Also. Um, it's either one of the yoga sutra school, you know, once you get into the six schools of Hindu, six classical schools of Hindu philosophy, let's call them. Khat Darshan, they are called. Like Sankhya is one of them, Advaita is one of them. And part of those is yoga sutras. Then within the yoga philosophies, there are multiple schools as well. Because there are people who master these things, right? Uh, so Bhakti Yoga is... Academics like to say this, and I'm saying academics intentionally here, that this is what happened in the Sant tradition of medieval India. And they lump everyone like Guru Nanak Sahib and Bhagat Kabir and Bhagat Ravidas into all this tradition. But really all of them, there are hundreds of them, but all of them weren't doing that. There is no answering to this because a lot of them actually are speaking even against it. Against Bhakti Yoga. In a sense that I'm not practicing this. Okay. What I can say, share with you is there are 15 Bhagats in Guru Granth Sahib. If, if I look at what they have written, I would call them radical Bhagats. Radical because they are not entertaining things of the past. They're saying, this is how I love. You got to explain the word Bhagat. Bhagat is the one who does bhakti, the devoted one. Okay. They are, so, you know, these words, and I'm glad you said this, because today the word means something else. It's become very political. Every word is like that. So you have to provide the context of, in fact, the subtext and the context and the pretext in that culture of the time. Okay. Is it annoying you that I'm simplifying things so much that I'm asking No, no, you? not at all. Okay. Not at all. I don't want to break the flow of the conversation. No. Huh? At the same time, we have like 12-year-olds who listen to the show. Uh, I'm glad you're doing it because that's providing context for them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, I, I'll, I'll try giving it a shot with Bhakti Yoga from what I understand, sure. which I've understood from the show. It's basically a format of devotion where say the love you would feel to your family or your romantic partner, you actually direct towards the Present, divine. Yeah. Uh, and just through that love and faith and uh, dhyan upon that love, you progress spiritually. Yeah. So from everything you described about Guru Nanak, it seems to me that he was doing a version of this, but you're saying it wasn't exactly this. No. So I want to ask you the difference. Sure. You're asking right now? Yes, yes, <laughs> I'm asking right. right now. Look, the, the problem with the existing terms is that we start, we start fixating and boxing people in them. Okay. And that's, Guru Nanak didn't say I'm doing Bhakti Yoga. So who am I to say he did Bhakti Yoga? Mm. And that's the reason I'm saying no, he's, he writes. He says, I am in love. He describes himself as a poet and a lover of the beloved. So that's what I want to use. Those are his phrases. You know, he used the word shire for himself. That's why he's not writing methodologically that do this, you know, five-step process, the three-step process, the top 10 things. That's what we are used to now. He doesn't say that because it's a relationship. And the relationship, what matters is eventually you figure out that this is how I want to live. And the way he writes about that is, for him, like he has a sister, he has a great relationship with his sister, he has a great relationship with his wife, he has two kids, his mom and dad are there, he has an incredible relationship with his mom, every time he came back from his journey, he used to go visit her and kiss her on her forehead. So it's not about that he's not involved in the affairs of life, but the love with a capital L, if I may call it, it's not transcendence of the lowercase l, it's a different plane altogether. So this is not saying that I will be detached. It is non-attachment, if I may use that vocabulary. Detachment is something else where you're actually are not feeling it. He is fully feeling, he's sweating. He is working. He is farming. He is still having intense concentrations with the yogis as well as the emperors like Babur. But at the same time, he's centered only on the one which he called a kovankar. Mm. His, his, Unique contribution, if I may call it, is Ekumankar, which by the way, does not mean there is one God. It means there is one creative and pervasive force. So this whole debate about atheism and the kind of God, he completely disrupts it. Let's expand this thought. <laughs> sure. Uh, because I think before we move forward in the story, I'd like to actually know about this thought because 
for me and i think an entire generation it means one universal power fair to that's say? fair okay something like that okay. uh, these are our words right so I, even the word i use the word force to explain uh, the word is onkar but he put the num- numeral one in front because see there's a debate richard dawkins is many people's god although he's an atheist because what does god mean the following the larger idea right and it gets disrupted from greek mythologies to abrahamic faith to indologies of various persuasion so we can't get fixated on the word it's a generic usage we all understand but he writes the numeral one because you know the word ik if you spell it out even in punjabi it can mean one few or many huh how that's right so this is why when you write the word one o n e it means all of those it depends on the context but when you write the numeral one this is a unity a numeric digit which means there is no other interpretation it's so when you interpret the uh, digit one it becomes about a affirmation of something god not negation like zero of something or nothingness god. so it's a departure from debate between zero and one which computer science people understand better i think than us <laughs> so it's not diabolic thing mm. it's saying there is only one okay and not a vague oneness spelled like o n e n e s s but letter number one which means there is a unity of everything it's a question of are you feeling it do you realize it are you acknowledging it and if you do all of that there are ones who actually live it incessantly not glimpses of it and they are the real lovers of the divine okay yeah. again before we move forward a little random question for you uh we had someone called ramyar karanje on the show he's a zoroastrianism expert hmm. and he told me that a lot of young parsis actually don't know the details he was speaking about on the show i have the same question for you do young sikhs all over the world know these aspects of their own culture i i think it's the same issue everywhere in the world including with sikhs many are aspiring towards it look what has happened is the knowledge transfer had stopped for a while so i'm going to the crux of the issue why they don't know i've been looking at myself like how i grew up as a sikh i in jhansi for first 12 years and then i end up in kansas in 86 and it's only when i went there i asked certain questions because i got asked i didn't know anything about six if who, you who asked you the people around me and the journey which i started then i'm asking myself like what 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 am i why do i look like this why do we do certain things the way we do it so until you have the query you really don't pursue knowledges right you assume things and this the osmosis is the people around us they basically make us whatever they want to make us so what has happened in most cases in the world not just with six the knowledge transfer wasn't going on a lot of assumptions were being made in the way we grow in the way so in the sick world i my estimate is for almost 70 years there was not much knowledge transfer and i can give example of that an average gurdwara in a village for example gurdwara by the way is not a worship center for six it has become that now even in bombay right it was a place of learning it was a place of organizing like this will shock you a gurdwara is used to organize political rallies also and not including in amritsar even 100 years ago in stockton california and vancouver like uh, the, the, in 1916 uh, they go to collect money for indian independence in stockton california mm. and they raise 7000 without even first making a building like send it back so a lot of things have changed in last 70 80 years so now everyone's doing worshiping do you think it's because of the world wars and all the no. turmoil that was going on guru nanak did that what good did what his idea of a place which we now call gurdwara he never said this is just to remember a divine and sing he's like because where did he do all this wherever he went you know i meant the knowledge transfer do you think it stopped in the last 70 years because of the world wars because of all oh the- in the sick world i can give you as i understand why it stopped sure. the in a average village the granthi the one who knows the granth is the literal meaning which is guru granth sahib the source of truth for six he knew that and he was a educated man more educated than the regular villager 
to the level where they would say, you know, read our letter, advice on marriages, advice on anything in life. Like a mentor for the whole village. Exactly. It's actually more like a counselor. Okay. And fairly educated individual with a high character. But in the last 70 years, it has been dismantled. Now people who are Granthis are less educated than an average constituency or a Sangat member. So how will they ever respect? That person is not switched on. That person is not trained. I mean, this person today, if you ask me, should be a double PhD. You know, one in the thought system, other in psychology. That's the only way you can help people. Why did you bring up psychology? Well, because you need to understand the various mindsets. As in people come to you with different problems? Absolutely. Okay. The counseling skills. Got it. Right? Uh, to, to be ability to be able to relate and then communicate and advise in their circumstances, which is relevant, rather than giving a preconceived, you know, preaching answer. Mm. Because that doesn't help. This is where barriers are now, right? Mm. Okay. Now we will continue the story, <laughs> sir. Back <laughs> to the 15th century. Okay. What would you like to know more about Guru Nanak? We stopped at the part where he meets Emperor Babar. And then he, uh, not just that, uh, that actually happened. So we're going back and forth on it. We're yep. not chronological right now. Best way but to do a okay. podcast. Sure. Um, well, let's talk about, uh, he was traveling the world. Mm. This this will be interesting. He went to Jagannath Puri. One second, I got, I got to dial you back okay. to the moment he met uh, Babar. Okay. So did Babar release him? Yes, he was released. He okay. was released by Babar. In fact, the folk tradition maintains that he then seeked Guru Nanak's blessing, the ability to be able to rule India. Okay. What does that mean now? Think about that. I want to Somebody who imprisoned you is now seeking your blessing. So there's an acknowledgement happening here that there are wrongs we do, there are crimes we commit. Classically, we call them sins, but they're crimes at the end of the day, right? You commit against individuals and against yourself. So those acknowledgements are happening. The ideas of forgiveness are happening. And then working to create better systems is going on as well. Okay. Now I'll let you continue the story. Sure. So part of the story is, which I think will be very relevant today, is he's having dialogues with multiple lifestyles. Because earlier and even today, honestly, you know, everything becomes spiritual and political. We run away from political and sometimes we overly hype the spiritual. Again, these are the common words. So he's going to those centers and having dialogues. He had dialogues with yogis. He has dial He goes to Jagannath Puri temple where Mrs. Gandhi was not allowed to enter. It's that strict. I'm just putting a perspective. He goes to Makkah where a non-Muslim cannot enter and he's having conversations with them. What does it take? The genius is just one element at our levels, but the communication ability, the way you present yourself, the way you're able to have a dialogue in disagreements, that's Guru Nanak. That's the real Guru Nanak, which is available to us in Guru Granth Sahib, what he writes himself, which is incredible. So in his travels, he's having these conversations. But it's come, there comes a point, and this is something different about him, which people may not know. He founds a new city. How many spiritual people do that? This is why to call him just spiritual is very problematic. What would you call him? Why do we need to call him anything? Don't. Tell he's him. his own model. He actually is dealing with, in the vocabulary which is written about him, is that he is both Raj and Jogi, Raj Jog. Mm. This is very interesting. Raj is political. Jog is union. That's the literal meaning, not just Yoga Sutras, right? That the meaning of Jog is Milap. Like Jog, Yog. Exactly. Similar. Same Yog and Jog is same. It's okay. just a linguistic variation, right? Gotcha. So that's what he is. He founds a new city called Kartarpur. Now, the question which someone like me, I visited there, I present on it now, I create a whole presentation because I found the old records. Why did he do that? All this is in Pakistan. In current Pakistan. You got to realize it's all Punjab. Yeah. And half of the Punjab in 47 is called West Punjab now, which is, in Pakistan, which is a larger Punjab, by the way. Mm. And the other half, it's like a butterfly's wing. Mm. This, may help you, this may help you and your audience understand certain things because it helped me. Actually, the map of Punjab, if you look at the original region of Punjab, looks like a butterfly. And one wing got clipped. Mm. That's part of the problem of Punjab. How do Sikhs feel generally about this, that, you know, so many important centers are in Pakistan. 
I know because I have a lot of Sindhi friends mm-hmm. who keep talking about at one point they wish to visit Sin. They just wish to see their roots. First time I went to Pakistan was in 84 June. I was very young. I remember everything I saw. And then I got stuck coming back to India because of what happened in 84. But in my adult life, I've been going there since 2007, visiting different places, having conversations with not just the Muslims of the time. I'm very interested in, you know, how is it that they're able to have a three-day festival in Lahore on somebody who was homosexual? And it's an Islamic state where homosexuality is illegal, right? You so the people's give- culture, uh, what I'm trying to say is Punjab's culture was very open culture. What is this? Shah Hussain. Okay. You know, the, the point what I'm trying to make is, I don't think we understand and we cannot understand Sikhs and Punjab. And they're not synonymous. They're two different entities, but Sikhs were primarily from Punjab and now we are global. Just from the political lens of India and Pakistan. Mm. Because that's a nationalistic lens. Which tells us some stories because you're interested in stories. But the story is much bigger. Yeah. Uh, the plurality of Punjab, Sikh tradition, Hindu tradition, Islamic tradition, Sindhi element will get lost completely. Otherwise, you'll only be telling stories from Bombay now, mm. which is what has happened. Parsi story is getting lost, as you mentioned earlier, because very few people, it hasn't been written much. You got to go back to one book on Zarathustra and what is being written about him, right? So the story is always told by people who live it. The problem in knowledge transfer where I was getting at, including in Sikh case, now it's being told by those who study it in a microscope, not those who live it. But what do you mean those who live it? Practice. Practitioners, at a, the lovers of the faith. Mm. You know, now we have, everywhere in the world, religiosity has become a, sociologist or a sociological or historical affair. They study a particular group of people in a particular group, place and time in a particular region. That's not all of it. What they're telling is true, but it's so small subset. It's like a small data point. And now we take the data point and we extrapolate to the whole community. That just, that's just not right. And you're saying Sikhi is a lot more about the practices also, which are not highlighted enough in mainstream narratives. Including in Sikh mainstream narratives. Okay. As in within a Gurdwara? Maybe within kids. Gurdwara, within textbooks in India, within the official history of India, which is sent to every embassy in the world, including what Mr. Nehru wrote in the glimpses of heritage. Mm. You know, because who, the victors tell the story, right? This is the common cliche. M- my hope is that hopefully podcasts like this change the direction of where history is taken. It, 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 it opens up avenues. That's right. I would also... Very humbly say, I feel bad for your generation, the generation before you. Like you'll have to live through a time without this kind of information out there on the internet. Yeah. And sure, I'll take you feeling sad for us. But my point <laughs> is, look, the reality is technology is constantly changing. Today, we think technology has disrupted the world and democratized it more, right? Yeah. But you know, earlier technology was paper. Mm. It was... A, You know, library from where I lived in Jhansi was not even a five-minute walk. I think I went there once. It just wasn't my ecosystem at the time. Okay. Now, so for those it was, they studied it. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, the thing we were talking about, how it's uh, political now hmm. with Pakistan and India. I think something audiences don't understand is something I've only learned through the show, talking to historians. Uh, borders as a concept are very fleeting. It's because we're born into a particular geography that we think, oh, this border means so much. But actually borders historically have always changed and they will keep changing all all the time. And in the case of Punjab, the Red Cliff line, to be very technical, is totally artificial. Yeah. Even when there are borders, the natural borders are always the terrains. Yeah. Like you know, the rivers or particular mountain or something of that nature, some water, right? Yeah. It's not the person who did that never seen the space. Yeah. It's so arbitrary. And he has written about it too as well. And his wife talks about it uh, posthumously. But my point, not just that, Ranveer. You know, we use passports. I'm here. You know, I have to use passport to enter this country, right? Or to go any other country in the world. And I travel a lot. Even passports were not a norm until 1970s. Mm. 
So our whole idea of borders, travels, migrations is very, very skewed. Mm. It's, it's like we have become small hearted now because it is about othering who is allowed and who's not allowed. Yeah. It's so small. Yeah. And in that smallness, we are creating a larger narrative, which is so flawed. That has happened everywhere, including in religion. Yeah. How do Sikhs feel about uh, the Punjab in Pakistan? Look, uh, if you listen to any decent Punjabi song, we don't see a separation. Mm. A Punjabi sada hai, o Punjabi sada hai. These are common songs. Mm. You know, because the land itself, the word Punjab, it means the land of five rivers. Ab is a Farsi or a Persian word for water. So when you have two and a half or three on one side and the other, something ain't right. Mm. Something ain't right. Yeah. Maybe in our lifetimes, we'll get to see. Well, I about. definitely dream like that. That's why I go on both sides of the border and work with certain individuals. Look, uh, what did Iqbal say? Hamari to dosti uno se hain jo dekhte hain khwab tare todne ke. So I, I want to live with bigger dreams. And within my lifetime, I've seen it happen with Germany. Mm. Cold War was much bigger than what India Pakistan is into. Yeah. But yeah. it got demolished. When the people's will overtakes the political will, it will happen. Mm. And we got to work on people's will. Political will will never happen. Yeah. They have to follow people's will. Yeah. And I was telling you, I love this job. Can it's because I get to meet people from so many different walks of life? The one thing I understood about especially Pakistan's political system. And again, I'm not trying to demean anyone or any country. But I know that uh, Pakistan as a country is run by the military. Everything from uh, journalism narratives to what people feel, people think. I think Pakistanis are very rapidly getting more and more educated thanks to the internet and thanks to access to different opinions. I'd say the same for India. Uh, but I definitely believe that the Pakistan military wants local Pakistanis to feel that India is the enemy and India is constantly trying to attack. Uh, and that's why there is that sense of division. But I also sense that it's fading away. Like, and this is again purely internet narratives through things I've learned by talking to military men, talking to geopolitical analysts, people like yourself. Yeah. Uh, my question to you, sir, is what is Pakistan actually like from your eyes, especially when you were visiting the uh, Sikhi related centers? What was it like? Opposite of this. Okay. And what you've said about Pakistan, one can make a case of India on that as well. Like who's really creating the narratives yeah. of India which are fed there and vice versa. So I'll leave that aside because that game is of spinning. Like on, you're saying there are narratives on both sides. Yeah, of course I see that. And they're available globally. Depends yeah. on what gets cited, you know, and who's using which IT cells these days. You know, mm. a lot of that's happening through a state propaganda. But look, when I visit there, not just the six centers, I go all over. I mean, I've been to Peshawar. I went all the way to Afghanistan border in Pakistan. Really? I go to Hindu centers. I've gone to the temples, which are much older than the heritage centers here in some cases. Because you see, it's a, we have to realize, you're talking about what's in the textbook. Harappa Mohan Jadaro is an old civilization. India and Pakistan is a modern context. Mm. It's a conquest context. It's a colonial context, right? Mm. So if you take that out for a second, it's the same people with multiplicity of ideas and plurality of religions and languages and culture is part of that. So I go to Takshla there too. Takshla is there. It's uh, where Guru Nanak, uh, there was a, there's a place called Panja Sahib. And from there, it's only about an hour drive and Takshla is right in the middle before we go to Islamabad. So I visit places which are historical, the museums, the cultural centers. I was actually speak in many forums, including the language forum called Pilak in Lahore. And I can tell you, the people's narrative is very clear. They love it. They, they love watch what? all the movies from here as well. They love India. They lo people's part. Now, every government has their own elements. So there are elements who don't like certain things. Obviously, there are state narratives everywhere. Last year, as two years ago, I said this, I'll share it on your show. What I noticed between India and Pakistan, if I may bring that together, because that's it. what I believe in. I believe in integrations of ideas and not feeding the forces which are more negative. Look, India is a relatively more democratic state, which has been called non-democratic now in the last few years, which is heading toward becoming a security state. Pakistan is a security state struggling to come out of being a security state. Mm. 
So that's where what's happening, politically speaking. When I look at people's level, if you look at exchange even this month, I mean, there are literature festivals where people like Jyoti Rai are sitting in Sindh and Karachi. Obviously, people's part is same. We cannot amplify the narrative which is divisive. The Hindu community of Pakistan, which people need to know, is actually pretty vibrant. Really? Which people don't know here because that narrative is not being told. The narrative. And it's larger in number than six. Narratives you hear at six mostly. Okay. You know, if you want to guess, you know how many six live in Pakistan? How many? Less than 9,000. You want to guess how many Hindus live in Pakistan? Go for it. It's Go. in lakhs. They have a strong lobbying group. They're educated. They're wealthy. They take, there was a case a year and a half ago where one of the pilgrimage centers, if I'll call it, it had a pool, a talabta, and they took the case all the way to the Supreme Court and warned because it was not being taken care. Actually, given the circumstances of the country, they are struggling, obviously, they are struggling as a country, but there is a lot going on there in terms of plurality as well. They have their own troubles with Ahmadiyyas, just like here, we have the, within the Hindu community, we have troubles on how to deal with uh, the tribes and the so-called the low caste. Those problems exist everywhere in the world because they have to do with in, internal racisms, we'll call it, right? I wanted to do one expansive episode on Sikhi with you. Uh, I think this episode is just about Guru Nanak Dev Ji and origins of Sikhi and kind of what it stands for today. Hmm. It's kind of an introduction to, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I keep stopping myself from saying Sikhism because of you now. It's all good. Uh, don't, don't get too worked up on it, but I understand. At so, least you're pausing now, right? And that was the idea to yeah. share that with you. Yeah. I think we were at the part of the story where you spoke about how he established his own city. Hmm, Kartarpur. So let's talk about Kartarpur. What was the purpose? So Guru Nanak started Kartarpur, right? Why did he have to do it if he's running around everywhere, talking to people, having dialogues, and changing certain minds too? But his job wasn't to change all the minds. One of the things which we discover is that he founded a new city. Because the people and the state, the policymakers, at the time it was more imperial and kings and chiefs, they wouldn't change the policies. So he says, let's look at the Ikhwankar paradigm. This oneness with a number one, not vagary of oneness but spelled out, and let's practice it here. So in that place, in Kartarpur, I mean, the description given is the yogis came to see him, the jannis came to see him, the householders came to see him, but very few stayed there to get mentored. And those very few is the beginning of what we now call six. You know, they came from various cities. Many came to check him out. Many came to have a dialogue with him, but few stayed to get mentored and it did not include his two sons. So the trans, the, 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 the institutionalization of Sikhi, as we may call it, it's really not an organized religion per se. It was more of what trainings are needed in order to create, change the policies in the world. First policy is my relationship with the divine as an outgrowth of that, how to live in the community. So this idea of anti-racism, anti-sexism, these are the words we use today. He was practicing at Kartarpur. Equality. Equality is still very much a 20th century understanding we carry from a universal suffrage movement from United Nations, because somebody's still deciding no, that you are equal, we give you this rights now, because we think from a legality angle now. Somebody's still deciding that. What he's saying is no. You, every human being on this earth is a product of divine gift. So from day one, there, there has to be zero tolerance for racism or sexism. That he practiced in Kartar. And six who stayed there, who got mentored in this, and eventually there's a transfer of leadership there. And this is the institution of Sikhi where one individual named Lena became Angad, and we call him Guru Angad, or the second Guru Nanak, who perfected that. And he built that further in another city called Khadur. So the thing I want you to know is that every guru founded a new city. Mm. What does it take to plan a city? Think about that even today. We can't even figure out how to plan our own organization or a block. You know, so architecturally, economically, because the policies were not being shifted in other spaces on how to practice this oneness. This is a huge difference between Guru Nanak's system, that it is not just personal, 
it has a very large element of community and not just community in idea as a utopian idea, but a lived realities. Mm. That's why you see the organization of Sikh faith and Sikh people in such organized way, because it got mandated by Guru Nanak himself. Mm. To draw out some more context from the time, uh, historical, political context, so the Mughals had like started establishing themselves. This was where Babar and Sher Shah and mm -hmm. all that was going on in the Delhi area. Yeah. I'm assuming that Rajasthan had all the Rajput kings yeah. at a uh, war with each other. This is what I've understood from history. Some at war, some in alliances. Depends on their allegiance, yes. Yeah. Uh, and possibly even the rest of India kind of had that kind of a scenario where it's either the Mughals or these little dynasties kind of up against each other or in alliance with each other. Mm -hmm. And whenever you refer to policies in what you're talking about Guru Nanak's time, you're talking about these kings. Uh, so the way the system works, right? So the emperor doesn't own all the land, right? Kings report to the emperor and chiefs report to the kings. So certain things, Badshah, your word, huh? uh, you're a ruler of a particular area, that's emperor, but under you are kings. Under kings are the chieftains. So when I'm referring to policy, this is the areas they lived in. Okay. Whatever the local domain was, they decided the policies. Okay. And policies were heavily decided by religious momentum of the past. With religious fervors, they still are very political because policy making is political. They just need endorsement of the religious authorities. Okay. Just like today, even in America, you know, why do they always have a reverend there? Billy Graham worked with seven presidents in America, regardless of whether they were Republicans or Democrats. It's true globally. This is why the spirituals, so-called, and politicians, so-called, they're always conspiring with each other to control masses. By the way, Guru Nanak wrote this. I actually want to mention this explicitly. He says, people who are just peers and people who are just mirs, mir is a short of amir, the political head. It's a Persian word. Both are Persian words. And he wrote this. He like people who are just doing one or the other, they actually work with each other to control the masses. <laughs> and that's the problem. And this is why Sikhs have a phrase called miri piri, which means become equally spiritual and equally political. So mm -hmm. you're aware of the both. Mm. The equivalent of like a Raj Rishi. Like that's Something the, like that, which earlier I said was a Raj Jog idea. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now I will let you expand on uh, Guru Nanak Dev Ji's kind of later life. What was happening in Kartarpur? Kartarpur, he's farming. Okay. Kartarpur, he's training what we today call next in line. What we call our exit plans. <laughs> Oh, yeah. like as in succession. Succession planning. He is also creating institutionalizations of what we're saying, what is that we believe in. So he wrote those. Because you see, in Indologies, as well as everywhere in the world, people think everything is biological. He's very aware of that. So he's making sure his thought and what he believes in, his experience uh, gets recorded. And so his kids and their descendants do not dilute it because they didn't get the guruship. His, both of his sons didn't get guruship. What were they up to? Against him. They started alternative religions, if you ask me. Really? Yeah. Like Odasi order is one of his sons. In fact, there's a great lesson in there. Even then, and this is what he's teaching through his life, that they may not agree with him. There's no condemnation. But it's such a clarity is there they are not the right next in line to continue the sect thought. Mm. So that's the level of clarity and love at the same time. Okay. Uh, when we began this podcast, I was going to allow you to continue the historical story in mm -hmm. this episode. This episode is too heavy by itself. Okay. So I think for the last section, we'll kind of get into the essence of what Sikhi is. Mm -hmm especially from a modern day context. Hmm. And then maybe in the sequel episode, we'll continue the historical story. So maybe. for now, let's talk about like the spiritual aspect of it. So hmm. where would you like to begin? From the beginning, Guru Nanak's original contribution, which is which his thought we will call today. What is that thought? So he has few phrases. They're called Mool Mantra in Sikh tradition. Ikko Vankar, Sat Naam, Karta Puruk, Nirpo, Nirvair, Akal Murad, Ajuni, Sabhang, Gurprasad. This is his paradigm. 
Everything else we have added, like men have added who are talking about Sikhi. He didn't say those things. What is he saying? There is only oneness with a number one. The identification with that oneness, Satnam, is with eternality. Sat is not truth. Truth is its interpretation. Sat word means something which remains forever, which is constant. He says, you want to identify with that one? You have to identify with that constancy, which means it is not the, the latest fad and the latest YouTube video or the latest podcast. <laughs> yeah? Because that's seasonal. The change. You know, everyone's got their uh, 30 seconds of fame kind of a thing. So that's the Satnam idea. Karta Purk is that this entity we believe in is creative. Karta is the creator, creative element. You know, Nirpaho is actually there is no exclusivity because there is no enemy. We have come up with that otherness, the animosities. Nirvair, Nirpaho is fearlessness, right? So most of the people in the world even today live in fear. Religion actually preys on fear and guilt. Even mm. today. And when I say pray, it's with an E. <laughs> so they'll make you do anything. By guaranteeing a spot for you after you die, dead, are you coming back to ask for your money back? <laughs> You're not. Mm. That's why they guarantee everything after death. Because they're praying with an E on your fear and guilt. And Guru Sankar Nanak Sahib is saying here that, look, no fear. Get rid of the fear of the messengers of deaths as well. And every mythology in every religion has their own version of it, right? Because that's why we say, I don't want to end up in hell, whatever that hell is, because there's a fear. Uh, when we are politically speaking these days, we are invoking fear of otherness. So nirpa and nirvair goes together, no animosity and no fear. So these are the requirements or chiseling is what I like to say. This is a chiseling of the individual behavior on how to feel the one. And then he ends with uh, Sabhang, for example. Sabhang is, it's a Sanskrit word, soyambhu, which means illumination is self now. Today's angle would be, at some point in my life, I better not be operating on borrowed knowledges. What does that mean? That means I'm not just quoting, you know, the latest book or the latest YouTube video. What is my personal experience of that? Is there any self-illumination? Or is it always citations of someone else? That's the borrowed experience of the divine. And then he ends with Gur Prasad, that there is an eternal wisdom whose grace do you feel that grace. That's it. That's his paradigm. If you notice, the whole paradigm is, how do I become like that one? So in Sikh thought, which is really, really remarkable is, we don't worship the one. That's the popular Sikhism. Guru Nanak's work vocabulary is, I want to become like the one. And he describes the one as this. So if I bring these behaviors, these qualities in my, I inculcate, I meditate on them, I reflect on them, I religiously work on them, which means as a discipline, right? Just like we say, I religiously go to exercise, which means you do it with a discipline, with a rhythm, with a cadence, as we call it today. If I do all of that, I can feel the grass too. Guru Nanak doesn't say nobody's, he says everyone's already graced. Question is, are you receiving it? Do you feel it? Once you start feeling it, you have become like the one. And that's a kovankar. That's a very, very powerful thing. Six used to do this. Most people who are like my, 99% of the six became six, seven to eight generations ago. And I use this as an example to say, this thought is what they believed in. You know, to, if somebody changes their religion today, you see how many people get worked up, right? It's very political and very personal. Even in families, there is ruckus. You know, like, ye ho jayega, wo ho jayega. Our forefathers and foremothers did it when they used to kill them for changing religions. They still did it because of this paradigm. Because they're like, ah, this is freeing me from fear. This is freeing me from animosities. I'd rather die but embrace this idea and live this idea. So they became six. Seven to eight generations. Of That's them. it. That's where most people became six. So it's like beginning of 1800s? Just 18th century, which is when most six were killed too, by the way when they were becoming. I don't know if you, most people are not aware of 18th century Sikh history. Which is what we'll talk about in the next episode. Sure. Wow. This is what I love about a few episodes. I begin in a particular tangent and then another tangent becomes so powerful and so intense that I'm forced to say, no, no. We'll <laughs> have to save that for later. Uh, just want to thank you, sir. Thank, you asked me before we started rolling why I wanted to do this topic. Uh, 
and the answer then and the answer now is to help younger indians hmm. and people of indian origin understand actual subcontinental history of uh, what we were before imperialism hmm. i think that that's a part of the internet that needs to be built out it's not available even in terms of reading material it's probably then some books uh, but there's a huge number of human beings who only listen or watch content in order to learn so to end the first episode i will actually ask you for higher knowledge like this it's always a very special person who comes on board to share it uh, and i know that you won't agree when i say that oh so you're a special person that's why the knowledge is flowing through you but for us you are so <laughs> i will just head into the next one with you sir thanks for the knowledge thanks for the wisdom and i'm really really looking forward to learning more from you so thank you oh, thank you so that was the end of only part 1 of this special on sikhi i think generally as a country we're at a point where we need to relearn our history the way it's supposed to be learned we need to learn more about indic religions indic philosophy the kind of thought processes that originated in the subcontinent history textbooks will never teach you the truth the way a podcast will and that's the genuine joy of this profession couldn't have asked for a more passionate guest than harinder singh so i'm telling you you're not ready for part 2 part 2 is even deeper even more elaborate but before i let you guys leave what i will request you to do is one spread this episode as much as you can on whatsapp the second request is make sure you check out our meditation app level and the final request is follow trs on spotify every episode is available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world the inter religious studies year has only begun lots more episodes related to history related to culture related to spirituality coming your way on trs